Hello and welcome to Red's Business and Technology Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Barnes. Today, we're sitting down with Kelly Hopkins, who's a, a business director at Hayes Defence. We'll be speaking everything about working with the Australian Department of Defence. Looking forward to sharing some of your insights and going through your background. Kelly, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm very qualified to be on a tech podcast. <laughs> awesome. We'll find out how true that is uh, through the episode. So let's start with, Kelly, your uh, background. Um, you've been in Brisbane for a long time. What did you start doing way back and then through the recruitment space? Absolutely. I started after university, I actually got picked up to work in TV, um, reality TV. You're looking at me and I can feel it, which was expected. Yep. <laughs> um, and as glamorous I thought it was, then I'd decided that reality TV is probably not best place. I did a few late night news sessions and then... So what did you do, what did you do at uni? I did communications, okay. international politics yeah. and... A whole mix. I wanted to do everything all at once. Okay. Very focused at that point. Yeah. Um, but no, it was really interesting and then saw the world of TV and I went, this is probably not what I envisioned. I really wanted to do script writing at that point too when I love politics. Um, it was always a bit of a running joke to my dad. I'm like, I'm going to be the first female prime minister and dad went, okay. Yeah. Like, do the work. And I went, all right, I'll go totally the opposite way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So, and then... Worked in more of job network and then I got the phone call one day from Hayes. I didn't even know who they were and 15 years later, here I am. Yeah. Why did you pivot into recruitment? Well, I was just speaking to a consultant and I still remember that day out of the blue, a gentleman called Adam. We're still friends to this day and he said, oh, do you want to come in? And I went, absolutely. We'll see what this is all about. And then I got rushed through an interview process same day. Yeah, right. I think I met three managers and then I was put into this group and I had no idea still what anything was about, um, but it was early IT, 2006, IT heyday. They yep. said you can come in and recruit for developers and I grew up with IT people in the yep. house. So I was like, done. And it was it was interesting. I got offered the job and I learned how to talk tech. Yeah, and you stayed there and been there for, for quite some time. Yeah. Um, you've got a lot of other exciting stuff going on recently. Do you want to dive into that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, now I've transitioned into defense which is probably i call it tech on crack if we can say that it's just <laughs> if you add billions of dollars of money into projects and get to execute those things get cooler and become slightly more important just a little bit yeah, yeah like critical yep. um so now working in the defense space and i do a lot within the defense industry so hayes defense team run that nationally and then we've got defense industry networking which Sandy Taylor started. It's the largest networking group now in all of Australia. So that's outside of defence. Um, and somewhat speaking of what we work in with defence, which is a community-based system, everyone in it together, mm -hmm. and recently been put into the board of NSAA, National Security Association of Australia. Awesome. Let's unpack the um, the Hayes piece first. Um, how, big, how big is Hayes? And is Defence like a massive operation for them? Like how many in your team? How does that work? Defence has always been big. So Hayes is one of the largest specialist recruitment companies in the world. We're UK based. Yep. Um, I think we're in 33 countries now. It's been a huge operation. We've been in Australia for over 40 years. It started off, I think, we noticed in the market, we've always been experts in technology-based systems. 15 years ago, Defence in Australia started to become a little bit more paramount. We went from acquiring US-based planes and going through sustainment projects and they really had to be a lens on how to fix human capital problems in that space. So mm -hmm. we were lucky enough at that stage that we had Vivian come over from the US who was in defence and in the US environment. Her dad was obviously a veteran and created the team. And then we expanded across the country just because we are in a rapid military expansion in Australia. So it was yeah. market versus need. And I think the thing is when we're looking at recruiting generally, we're just looking at skills. In defence, we're looking at so much more. It's systems. There's requirements in nationalities and ITAR and security systems. So it was really a good time to have a team that just solely focuses on that. Yeah, very specialised. Very specialised. It's a lot different hiring for defence than it would be like an accounting firm or like a, any standard kind of... It's it's a little... You do have to put a little bit more thought into it. Um, but it's 
I don't think you would ever be have an opportunity. And like I said to you before, like where else would I get to climb through a, you know, a plane? Like I get to climb through KC30s and yeah. Yeah, I get to see, it's, it's just really cool. Yeah, let's um let's unpack that a little bit. So the uh, working with defence and people listening, this is, might be some good insight to how your business or an individual can start working with defence. Um, just to paint that picture before we jump into the some of the associations you're working with now, um, give us an example of some exciting technology that or you've introduced into working with the Department of Defence. So I'll give some premise. We're not obviously doing that through recruitment. Um, a lot of the work we did as we built this community around us in defence there was some needs to be able to assist smaller organisations to gain access to what is quite a difficult group of people to work with by no fault of their own. Defence is a big beast, so it's about mitigating risk. As it should be, right? As it should be. Mm. Classified secrets, yeah. national security, sovereign capability. Um, so through our networks years ago I met uh, Tim Wormsley and he runs Benchon, which is a phenomenal tech-based supply chain portal. And we were thinking one night, we were just creating issues, I think, for ourselves, we call it. But we went, wouldn't it be great at if we could take all of these amazing companies that we work with and some of these new tech-based systems and give them direct access through our contacts that we know at Primes? At that time, too, Defence runs four major events every year. So they're run by AMDA and its association that does them across the year. And for us, well, across every few years, for us, that's our opportunity for the whole industry Australia-wide to come together, meet, embed. It was Land Forces 2022 and we said, let's just do a really small program and we'll take, we'll open it up for registration, we'll take SMEs and we'll give them an opportunity to meet these people. And I think we just thought, well, oh, we'll get four primes and like it turned out to 12 primes. We spent three days. What's a prime okay. in your words? So... Uh, a prime is an organisation that has a direct contract with defence. Right, yep. Um, MSPs are the ones that sit in the middle, managed service providers. Mm -hmm. It's CASG, procurement, ADF. I explained that poorly, I'll do it again. Australian Defence Force. So yep. all capability that the industry works in is essentially to support ADF, the Australian Defence Force. Department of Defence has CASG, which sits there as a group that releases and monitors all the contracts. And then we've got different levels of engagement. So above the line, contracting and below the line. Above the line is for people that are wanting to, they, get, they contract in on other contracts. Below the line is contracts that organisations have won and they're delivering straight to defence. Right. It's very interesting and I've probably done the worst job ever of explaining how that ecosystem no, that's okay. works. I didn't know that works. I'm going to learn a lot out of this. <laughs> that's great. This will be like we'll both we'll cliff notes. No, so... Um, yeah, so what turned out to be a really nice little idea turned out to be this massive thing and we facilitated 181 meetings wow. over three days. The Queensland Government, the Defence Hub, and we'll talk more about resources available um, for people wanting to and organisations to get into defence, but our Defence Hub in Queensland is phenomenal. It's defence jobs and we'd reached out to Christine and Tori and the team and said, are you interested in supporting us to facilitate this? Because it's bigger than Ben-Hur. We've got day jobs. Um, and they helped out. And I spoke to an organisation the other day and they started with like nearly $100 investment in 2022 Meet the Primes and they're turning over $3.6 million now. Wow. Like it's insane. Mm. So organisations that Primes would never have the ac like access to. Yep. And we base the capability on where the need is. That's the next point. So you started that Meet the Primes essentially um, and you thought it was going to be a little thing and it turned into a mass massive thing. It turned into a massive thing and now it's run. We did the last one in Avalon and we were lucky enough at that stage, Steve Baxter, Shark Tank. Yep. He's great. Uh, he has beaten Zone Ventures. He decided to essentially host it for us there. Oh, cool. Um, Am just picked it up for us now. So they're actually sponsoring it for it for free. Wow. So Indo-Pacific in November, they'll be giving us two whole conference centres to run it from. Wow. So yeah. it's really blown up. It is blown up. You, you mentioned um, off air and it might be um, a good kind of talking point because I want to hear this story and I want mm. to say for, so for on air. The, around the flight simulator. Can you go into what happened there? So there's always these weird and wonderful stories that I get told of people in defence and some of these ideas, and I'm all for it because I am a massive geek. So if <laughs> someone's going to tell me these stories, I'm like, that's so cool. So 
I was speaking to someone from Department of Defence and they're actually a good friend now and they ran all the contracts for Army and he called me one day and I said, oh, what are you doing? And he goes, we have to go see a gentleman about a flight simulator in his garage in Brisbane. And I went, what do you mean? And he's like, well, there's a guy in Brisbane that's built a flight simulator. And I went, in his garage? And he goes, yep. And he's like, but we're just going to go buy it. <laughs> and I was like, who's building flight simulators? But yeah. it's the second company that I've heard of, of these guys. Like, sorry, there's another really big company and they're pretty well known at the moment. This guy was doing his helicopter license, right? Yep. Needed a way to do flying hours in COVID and he went and built a helicopter simulator. And wow. now he's selling it to defence across the world. So is that something where <laughs> you're just building on the side and they would actually design like the platform and like that's their IP they're then selling to Defence Australia and everywhere else, like to, essentially from the garage turned to a f- fallen f- business? Yeah. Well, wow. I think – Australia is a little bit different with how we run defence and how we acquire. It's not like US defence. US defence is quite rogue. Okay. Hopefully no one's watching this from US defence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a knock on the door next week. Um, there is a bit of lack of IP and everything in the US. So I think essentially, and I may get fact-checked on this, if you sell something into defence, they can just take your patents and build it themselves. Oh, wow. It's a bit rogue. Yeah. Here we're a bit different. So either a lot of organisations will see shortfalls in defence or there'll be contracts released and they've built a solution specifically for that. So they might be a maritime company and they're working on shipbuilding and it could be all the way down to an organisation that makes cables. And I remember being at Indo-Pacific years ago and there was a gentleman that created a cable which was waterproof. So it was all the electricals but he'd wrapped it in this really composite plastic which was just next level and... He was a major stockist then into future programs. And I was like, who even thinks of this stuff? Yeah. Like, Did he supply that to Defence Australia or was that US? He was doing that in well to the Navy in Australia. Yeah, right. As part of naval maritime programs. And then I guess the thing is, the one thing we don't do well in Australia is we've got a lot of amazing companies providing products to Defence, but there's not a lot of cross-sell into other areas. Right. Which is a real shame. Why? We don't have a broad acre lens on any of our programs or any right. of our... Because of the sensitivity. The classification um, yeah. and everything being classified does cause problems, mm. 100%. But I think it does create an environment sometimes where they forget that we are now in a situation with other technological programs and businesses that... An example, if we're doing a hypersonics program for Mars to look at carbonizer Oh, sorry, a carbonisation project for Mars... Mm-hmm. Could we not look at that for sustainability? For, yeah. Like other applications. Yeah. yeah, other applications for some of these products, but mm. defense can be a little bit all encompassing. So when you're working as a defense company, you're all in. You're all in, yeah. yeah. Okay. You make it sound so easy um, working with Department of Defense, uh, someone in the flight simulator in the garage, or <laughs> and then, the then starts working with the them. Rule. I'm sure that happened like overnight as well. 100%. It was um, like straight away, signed up. <laughs> <laughs> How can small businesses work with defence? What does that process look like? It is, I think the one thing we do really well in Australia is we do have a lot of state-based defence programs. So we've got defence jobs in Queensland, which have two hubs, Townsville and Ipswich-based. We've got Defence SA, Defence WA, Defence Victoria. So we've got Otis sitting at a federal level as well. These organisations have been specifically put what's, together. What's, what's Otis? Otis is the Office of Defence Industry okay. Support. Um, so what they've been doing is they've been saying, look, we do realise that we need to have SMEs and small to medium businesses in defence. They've created a suite of training programs to be able to get businesses defence ready. So whether right. it's talking about this is how you get in all the way from quad chart training, you know, through to this is how you need to set your business up. This is who you can speak to in regards to security certifications. This is who you speak to about cyber. There's a lot of resources now, Mm -hmm. like everything, when there's a lot of resources and a lot of information, it makes it really hard to coordinate. Overwhelming. Very overwhelming. What What would you say would be the first step of someone? Let's say someone's listening and they, you know, manufacturing business and they have a product they think there's a perfect fit for defense. Where should they go first? They should go to the government to start. Absolutely. They should look at their regional and defence hubs. The people that work in these businesses are some of the most passionate you've ever seen. They're connectors. Okay. So they will look at a capability and they'll turn around and say, 
this is where you need to be. And they will go out of their way to connect organisations to the right people yep. if it's a product which needs to be expedited. So this is the difference. There are certain things when we have advanced military applications and we have this rapid defence growth, certain things will take precedence. You know, we've just had the DSR, which was the Defence Strategic Review, which means that we put programs to the side yep. because they weren't critical for national security at the moment. We had to do a pivot, favourite word through COVID, yeah. and we've said there's so many threats across a certain area, we need to expedite programs in missile systems and ballistic weapons and land-based weapons. So things will take a bit of a pivot. So there's not always a guarantee there'll be a place. Mm -hmm. But to look in a defence hub to start, get the information and assess, is this something we can do? Because it's not easy. So do you need to know someone like you who's connected into defence to go and do that? Or is there – you can't just go, like, knock on the door of defence, right? Like, well, you can get to a base. Yeah, so, <laughs> Order these organisations. No. So when you say, like, go to a defence hub, what does that mean in, in practicality? Does that mean, like, is there, like, a website you can go to to, to submit to speak to someone? Do you literally start on Google? Or do you have to go through someone like yourself to go who knows who to speak to? You've picked up a really big shortfall in mm. the industry that there is no coordinated industry alliance – no general overarching information hub. Um, look, Defence Hub and Defence Jobs, so if you just put up in Defence Jobs Queensland or you look at Otis, there should be a suite of other information that connects people to other hubs. Okay. But it's largely self-led at the moment. You know, we spoke about at Nauseam that depending on what state you're in, there'll be a lot of activities and trade shows. You'll be able to meet people at networking events, but we've got no coordinated effort, which is mm. bizarre to me because – Everything we talk about is national security and national programs, but it's state-led yeah, and right. not Not centralised. Not centralised. No procurement body or someone that go to to centralise to this kind of stuff, which is um, – it's funny when you're saying those acronyms earlier. It's like I feel like someone who just, you know, starts in IT and you've got all these acronyms to learn. I feel like sometimes it's like working with defence. You've got to learn all these, like, governing bodies and procurement teams and words and it's things you've got to go and do. It's a whole other language. Mm. And every group of ADF speak – a whole other language. Yeah. I've never – I mean, I remember from IT I'd say, oh, you know, coding's easy, you just change the syntax. Like I still remember that. Change the syntax. That yep. was my line. Yeah. <laughs> and this, you're just like, oh, I've – they're great though. Defence yep. is great. They're one of the only industries that you can turn around and say, oh, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they're like, oh, we'll bring you along for the journey and they'll fill you in. They're such good people. That's, that's good. They're good. So – what is, what's some advice you have, Kelly, for someone in a business on how do you get your business ready to work with defence? Preparation is key. When you're working with a body like defence where it is risk adverse, we're talking about national security, secured networks, mm -hmm. classification, classification, all these things, you need to really look at what you've got across a whole suite of services. Do we have QA systems in place? Like can we meet a level of compliance to work with defence? Because – when we – and I think that people get a little bit – it's a little bit of a un, lack of understanding. So when we're talking about organisations like your Boeings and your Northrop Grumman's, they're not going to burn their house down for one project in Australia. They're risk adverse for a reason. So they've got procurement processes, checks and balances, their own quality and assurance systems that these organisations have to get through. So it's really about finding the sweet spot and the synergies of how to work with them. So – Preparation is checking out defence hubs, talking to professionals, being able to come to networking nights and saying to other people working in defence, oh, this is where I'm at, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. Once you've got all the systems in place, it's got to meet the need at the time. But it has to be an understanding that you will be learning a lot of new things that you've probably never had to learn before and it's a level of patience because mm. – like all things, Rome was not built in a day. When an industry is this risk adverse, it's not going to be, you know, a rubber stamp on a project tomorrow. It takes a lot of time and you can be doing this for two years before getting ready. Curious on that. So <clears throat> that example you said earlier about some of the flight simulator and then working with defence, um, and it maybe it's in general, like when someone has a service or a product when they're ready to essentially work with defence, what is the kind of time frames on them, someone like that landing a defence contract? Is it something that like – you need to work on for years and years and years. You got to get ready, and then and then try and network, and try and introduce your product. Wait for it to get up the important scale and do like what? What does that time frame look like? It depends. There is always the exception to the rule. I was with a prime not long ago, and they got a totally unknown SME at research and development stage in a product 
to be part of their supply chain supplying that technology in three months. Wow. But when you have something that doesn't exist, that that helps. Yeah. You know, if if you have something that no one else has come up with yet or a technology which is going to solve a problem, of course industry is going to work with you at nauseam to get it through. I think generally it can take one to two years it can take three to five, depending on where you're at and how many you want to sell in. Because once you've got one program or you're supplying, you know, a bolt or something into one, it can then be a case study to on sell. It just gets easier once you mm-hmm. understand how to work in that ecosystem. What does the defence industry need more of? Like what, what as in terms of like service offerings and, and businesses that, and suppliers and that kind of thing, what does the defence currently need more of? Well, it needs more people. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. Well, <laughs> People really yeah. help. Yep. So, no, technology. So the things at the moment that everyone's talking about, we need smarter systems. Where is AI sitting at? Do we have technology-based solutions that can work in a closed defence network? You know, when we're talking high-level classification and, like, dream-specific hardwired defence calls, like, can we plug those in? Um, automation systems at the moment – Everything cool, quantum coding, hypersonics, um, basic things like training systems as well. You know, just things which can expedite, help, move along, make a process run more smoothly, all of these things. But it can be as easy as I've heard of a company building a bolt for a tank and that bolt can withstand explosions. You know, so... Things, just things. S- something small, innovative. Something small, yeah. which is innovative, which solves a problem. And I think if you're looking from defence, there's plenty of information what we're focusing on at the moment. You know, I was, I've got a friend that's building rockets in their rooms, like in their <laughs> lounge room. Like, here's a picture of my rocket. It's about to get, we're about to test it. And I'm like, who does that? Like, yeah. it's just, <laughs> like, who? Crazy. So, Around the cyber element, which I know you touch on a fair amount of times, and I completely understand, but because of the you know, type of <laughs> organisation the Department of Defence is, but what is the importance of cyber programs for companies that supply to defence? Put it this way, cyber in defence is, I would say, more important than anything at the moment. Like I said, we're in a rapid military growth phase of our life cycle at the moment. And it makes sense when people look at Australia – We're, what, 232 years old at the moment from when we were building where we're at. So we now need to get all of our military systems up to the rest of the world. You know, they're a lot more advanced than us when you look at US and the UK. Yeah. We are working with classified technology and any part of that supply chain is part of classified technology. What I don't think people realise about cyber and how it applies to defence organisations and defence SMEs is we protect defence secrets schematics, design processes, personal data, but then it goes as big as critical infrastructure. If we're building capability, whether it be a tank or a plane, we're protecting the critical infrastructure of what's being built, the buildings that it's in. So defence now needs to think a bit wider as well. And when we look at cyber, we're talking about total risk of cyber and like of our assets because if we go to war, we need a really good basis of being able to stop cyber attacks because it can stop our power, it can cut our water yep. now. It can just impede things, which makes us weak from well, a military. Well, that's actually what happened with, like, the Ukraine-Russia thing, right? They were that's going what for, happened. like, you know, nuclear power plants and, like, telecommunication towers was the other thing they were kind of going after. But right? Ukraine wasn't meant to happen like that. Mm. So we had Yuri and Vassal at our, like, a, a conference, and Yuri said something which was – really point in. He said, this was meant to be a technological place war. We were meant to have an IT war. Mm. Like, we were ready. And now we're doing, we're fighting hand-to-hand combat. Yeah. I must say, I, I didn't think in my lifetime I'd ever see like another like, you know, war like that happen. And when that broke out, I was kind of like, I really thought it would be that like cyber warfare and then like, you know, economy and then supply and that. But it was literally like, you know, tanks and people going into other countries. I, I didn't did not think I would, I would see that in my lifetime, to be honest with you. Um, but here we are. But I think it's it's something to be mindful of. And I think people forget when we look yeah. at national security and sovereign capability, what we do now and the way that I think of how this industry works is that if we're putting our men and women in the ADF in a frontline position, all the products that are being built, all of these mission-critical systems, 
is to hopefully help them save their own lives as well. We yeah. don't want to put them at risk. If we can build tanks which are smarter and, you know, can actually withstand an explosion and it's protecting the people in it. Mm. If we can do things to impede a war coming to our country, whether it's missile systems or early detection systems, sonar, radar, again, these are the things that we should be investing into because we're not just protecting our soldiers, we're protecting our people yep. and our assets. So it is, I think it was timely that because we've been such through, you know, we've all been such through such a good time in history and a lot of people are forgetting Afghanistan and Iraq and it was 22 years ago yesterday that yeah. 9-11 happened. I think sometimes we need to be reminded that how crucial it is that these systems exist. Yeah. I think people forget, forget about that a lot of times. I think in the business world when you're trying to work with defence, right, which you know, Red doesn't really do, but I know other businesses that have done that, they look at it as like this thing is hard to deal with, a um, lot of red tape, a lot of networking, but then look at it once you, once you get in the yeah. door, which is like probably not when you look at it like the lens you just you just spoke about. But not the best way to look at this stuff. It should almost be like doing a service to protect, you know, Australians. Um, it's a service ethos. I feel that that's why people are really passionate about mm. working in defence. All of us have a certain part to play mm. and we are all any part of the network and any part of the industry, it's all in it together. And this is how I think about it. People say, oh, what about the morality of, you know, building tanks and having guns? If it's in someone's hands and they're put into a situation where they have to defend themselves, if we can be smarter in our technology and create systems where we don't want to go to war, but if we can impede that and stop that and it's protecting our people, 100%. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the um, defence industry networking. You've been a director there for, what, nine years now? Um, what's the purpose of that organisation and, and what do you do? Well, I've been part of it for a long time. I've only taken over. So Sandy okay. Taylor started defence industry networking because I call him like – I don't think he knows that I call him this behind the scenes, but he's the cruise ship director of defence. Like okay. he, I think he's part of the group that started connecting where they realised that – the industry is so far apart that they really had to forge relationships themselves to get an understanding of what everyone did and how they all fit in together. So he saw a need two ways to connect businesses and SMEs, but also two to help veterans transition, to give them a safe place where they can come along, meet other businesses and get some real life advice as to what to do next. Yeah. So it started years ago in Canberra and a really small and then it launched in Brisbane and now it's in every state across Australia. It's about to go over New Zealand, pop-ups all around the world. Yeah, well, how many members as part of that currently? Um, at the moment, I think there's over 16,000 wow. in Australia. Yeah, awesome. And um, let's talk a little about the um, NSAA, National Security Session in Australia, that time uh, I went to the launch. You were and, at um, the launch. You, like, tw- and I was wearing pink ago. again, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> this is not normal. Oh, yeah, I was wearing pink. I, no, oh, sorry, I, I don't. Pink, just, so. just for you. <laughs> um, Give an overview of the mission that you were doing there with with Alloc and Co. Yep. Again, I think when we talk about sovereign capability, there is a bit of a lack of understanding as to defence having a broader lens. So yep. when we look at sovereign capability and where it comes from national security, it needs to take into all things. So it is about defence systems and defence, but it's also about our agriculture and our critical infrastructure and Things that I don't think a lot of people think about when they go, oh, well, we need all of these things to Mm -hmm. live the way that we do and to flourish. So for us, it was really important. And for Alok, he's really passionate about just doing things with a very broad acre view, being able to passionately expedite critical things that need to be done for defence. And to give you an example, like I said before, if we can look at new technology and be able to push that into avenues that it hasn't been able to get to because there is experts looking at things saying this needs to go there and those connections are made and they've got the support. It's not about having government be part of the process. Like we know the government's there and then it's about industry leading. But again, broad acre views, Mm -hmm. bringing everyone together, making sure that things are being looked at in a sensible fashion in a coordinated effort. Okay. which now is more important than ever. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think you're right. People don't think about that critical infrastructure stuff um, except like when the floods happen and they're like, oh, I can't get milk and can't get food and that kind of thing. Uh, so no one really thinks about it until it is a problem. Yeah, um, North Queensland discovered there was powder milk during the yeah. 2011 floods. Yeah. There's no milk left. Oh, what's powdered milk? Yeah. Um, and it was cut off one highway and we had friends cut off for weeks. Yep. 
you know, and I think that's what we need to think about. We in Queensland particularly think about natural disasters impeding our day-to-day life. Yeah. You know, it's a big event. Everyone's great. We clean it up, but we don't think about what's next. We think about critical disasters or, you know, if you look at that from a, a military perspective, God forbid that ever happened, mm. but there is things that we can do now with how we're looking at critical infrastructure that protect those assets for yeah. hopefully not happening situations. Yeah, but if something does happen, obviously, then, yeah, it's definitely organisations like the NSAA mm-hmm. to consider this stuff and to create that kind of community. So it's uh, pretty exciting what um, you're doing there. Yeah, and I think too, like, I mean, Israel, for example, you can't go onto a train without – that train's bomb ready. Mm. It's got, you know, it's protected. And I think things too, like plan for the worst, expect the best, but at least have the systems in place where we are not always being reactive. We have to future plan. Yep, definitely. Let's um, pivot back to the recruitment side, so the, the day job. The um, day job. <laughs> the day job, as you called earlier. Um, mostly in Shesham Insight and in your experience, because you've been like, uh, you know, 15 years in the recruitment industry now. Um Let's keep it open first. How do you find good people? Oh, it's a very good question. A lot of work. Yeah, okay. It's a lot of work to find good people. The world of recruitment's changed. I mean, we spoke about this before and you said, what was it like back in the day? And I would yep. be like, we had higher unemployment. So we had a, a lot of people and we had a high level of immigration. So we had a lot of talent. Um, we also didn't have the expansion of economic systems and projects, which we have now. Um, so before it was probably easier, you know, a lot of organizations will say, we posted a job out on seek and we had you know, 300 applications and they were all quality and it was really hard for us. Yeah. But it's also about industry meeting the situation at the moment. I think gone are the days where people would say, Oh, I, I want a unicorn on a rainbow. And I'm like, that doesn't exist. Mm. You know, it's, it's just about using – and now we are – you know, where we work, we utilise and are experts in systems. Um, our CEO who's just retired, he was an AI engineer. Really? Yeah, over in the UK. And it was actually quite funny looking at someone from that lens where he was looking at new technology and how we create systems in our own business. So we've had AI automation in our systems talking to us for years. Yeah, right. Because that's how much we invest within our databases and our platforms. So roll, roll back to 15 years ago when you first started at Hayes um, yep. and took, took the job. There would have been like, I guess, like no LinkedIn back then, would have been more like newspaper focused, I'd imagine. We had ads. You would – so – What how would that look like? It was great. That's great. It was great. Like I said to you before, so – I had to code in HTML my own Seek adverts for keywords. Yeah, right. A skill. Um, so, yes, we're talking it was – well, we actually had at that stage, and I still remember Adapt, which was one of our f- biggest investments, which was our database. So we thought we were incredibly advanced, and we were. We would have searches set up, and my boss at that time had things – like, and we did IT recruitment, so we thought we were the bee's knees. Um, it was a lot of find and engage – being able to eat, we, that was the start of emailing people. Right. Like yep. we would, e- not for, you know, please send this on to your 20 friends and otherwise your pet won't die, like early MSN <laughs> emails. Yeah, right. We would start emailing people with jobs, um, seeking everything that was just coming where, through. Where would you find individuals back then? They would. Have, well, it was mostly driven at that stage by Seek. Okay. So other job boards at that point. Candidate attraction strategies, newspapers. We were yep. Australia's largest newspaper yeah, advertiser. Right. Yep. It was a very fair point. We actually helped seek establish in Australia as an organization and backed them. And we were, we were their largest account. Yeah, right. It was a different time, but technology was just meeting recruitment. Yeah. So it went from, and I was there for it. So we used to have paper files and it was great because if your laptop, like if your computer died, you could still pull out a hard file and call someone. Yeah. And then we transitioned out of that because now file security and data security, our cyber security as an organisation is huge. Mm. And it's something that we put a lot of money into investing because we have probably more details than a bank. So our systems and processes are next level from a secure perspective. So we saw this very easy breezy world of paper-based systems now into full-blown you can't move from your computer. Lockdown. Lockdown. Yep. 
swipe cards, treat us like bank security, which is – it's really interesting how it's all changed. Yeah, which is good though because I'm amazing. you know, if, if there's a candidate wants to go to recruitment, especially for defence, right, uh, they don't want their details going to any like hodgepodge recruitment or company or getting leaked or anything, right? This so. is what blows my mind though because I look at CVs and people have so many of their personal details still. Mm. You know, my date of birth, who I'm married to – I've had people there put my visa number before. You know, I'm just like calling them going, you don't need all of these things. I can, yep. you don't know who this is going to. And there was a lot of seek scams for a period and job board scams where there was actually people advertising for jobs and stealing people's data. Yeah, right. Which now people are a little bit more mindful. So what are you seeing from the recruitment industry now? Um, imagine now you've got things like LinkedIn be big and, and seek and like how do you find people in advertised roles currently? We as an organisation had to look internally it was we saw a change in how people were applying to jobs. Well, the Seek numbers weren't adding up anymore. People weren't coming home and looking at, say, LinkedIn or Seek to find their new job. They were coming home and sitting on social media. Okay. So we had to track data like all good companies do and we said our investment needs to be into our own system. So our investment was building new databases which are technologically driven with AI built in our website was re-amplified to be able to contain data and be its own job platform. Mm -hmm. It has been totally set up with our marketing team behind the scenes in regards to capturing like the ROI, every interaction that a human has with our systems is tracked and we can follow it up. And we have all of these tools now integrated to to make our life easier from a find and engage, but never taking away from the human connection, which is, You still want to talk to people, assess whom they are and match them to the best organisation. Yeah, okay. So how does it differ trying to find defence candidates and place people versus standard recruitment? Um, Are they in different circles or is that – how is that different? Defence is networked. So when you're talking about – to give you an example, um, we've got international trafficking of arms, ITAR and EAR systems. So there's – Barriers to trade, we call it. So there's certain regulations which we have in defence, which, you know, we're, we're buying things from overseas, so we're taking on some of their defence liabilities. So when we're looking at candidates, if a client says to us, this person needs to be able to work on an ITAR program. So I would have a client come to me and say, Kelly, can you find me a system engineer who's ITAR compliant? What's ITAR compliant? So international traffic of arms. So to give you an example, right. I would have to find an Australian citizen whom hasn't been born in the unprescribed list of countries, so China, Yep. Um, that has, you know, and they will say we need a defence clearance. So that's great. Yep. So all of these things that impede. Make it so much harder to find. Makes it harder. Yeah. But I think that when I said about networking, our systems attract to be able to help us find those people. But for us, that's why we do so much within the industry because our candidates are our clients and we're always trying to find new people, we have veteran programs specifically set up so we can transition people out of the ADF into the yeah, defence cool. industry. So we're always finding people, but it's hard. And it's, yeah. it's again, more restrictions. I call it like a Rubik's Cube of def- like recruitment because mm-hmm. you just sit there and you go, what are they going to give me now? Yeah, because I have big requirements and then you have a lot of these candidates and you go look at them and they go, oh, hang on, where were you born? How old are you? And like all these other checkboxes. Just check all these restrictions, yeah. um, which is what we talk about, this human capital crisis in defence. Yep. It's it's classified and there's restrictions for a reason because yep. national security is really important. Mm. But we don't help ourselves at all. Yeah. yeah. But that's understandable. What advice would you have for uh, someone in a business now who's looking for maybe a recruitment agency to, to partner with to go and find someone? This is more generally speaking, not yeah. so much defence, right? But um, I know you've been in the industry for a long time around recruitment, so you probably know what good looks like and what bad looks like. What kind of questions would you ask a recruitment agency who you're looking at partnering with? Firstly, I would want to know, if I was a business, I'd want to know what that recruitment company knows about me. So if I'm looking, I think heavily looking at, at the moment their reputation online, if someone's really passionate about something at the moment, they're going to leave a review. Um, so do some homework. And if you're having an introduction to an agency, see if they come to you with a knowledge and understanding of your business and your values. If they've taken the time to do the homework, they want a partner. And that's what's important. 
I know a lot of agencies and will go in and they'll be selling all of their benefits. Like we have many benefits of working for us. We're massive. There is things, but it doesn't mean anything to an organization that wants you to care about them. Mm, so definitely that's good advice actually to make sure they're coming prepared and actually want want to partner with you, yeah. learn about your business understanding, if they demonstrate that back to you. When you actually go speak sit down with them and they say they come and they go, cool, this is your business. We want to work with you. What questions would you ask them? Oh, I know what questions I'd want to ask my clients now because I've turned it around because I think partnerships both ways. Okay. But I would ask about, yes, their resources and systems. I mean, let's be honest. We are in a very candidate short market at the moment Mm. and we are, I think, 500,000 people short from an immigration perspective. So, I want to know that they're going to be able to get me people. So you can ask someone to their database. I want to know the how. How many people are they placing? How do they do it? Okay. Then I want to know about their process. That would be my next question. So do they have an established recruitment process? What guarantees do they have? Just walk me through step by step. Yep. I'd want to know about to what are they going to charge me? Always good, I yep. think. You know, yep. return on investment. Yeah. But I think too then probably less speaking from them, more listening, but then a good recruiter will sit there and quite quickly establish that model of going, this is not a transaction for me. You know, if I really want to work with you, and Jackson, if I really want to work with your business moving forward, I want to know all the things. Mm. Like I want to know all about the staff. I want to know all about where you're at, what your growth plans are, what your values are, because I have to guarantee my work. So it's not just me throwing a human at you and walking away. Yep, it's a partnership. It's a partnership. Mm. So, your business. Yeah. yeah. That's much like uh, what we do in IT, right? We, you know, we're well, a technology partner and what we change to um, because with IT, you know, you, you get keys to the castle and strategy and systems, and that kind of thing. If, if we are just to rock up and, um, you know, throw price, pricing on the table, even if it's the cheapest, you, it doesn't make any sense. You need to understand their business and what they're going in what direction. So that's, def- that's definitely good advice when you're finding a recruitment partner to make sure that they understand your business first and done the homework, that kind of thing. They come in and then, and then make sure they really want to understand where your business is, is at. And you got to like them. Yeah. I mean, you have to like the individual. I think go with your gut. You'll know, it's like anything in business. You'll know straight away of someone that you click with and you want to invest in. And I think that's part of the relationship. But be smart. You know, in a sort of, like I said, in an industry at the moment, which is short, sometimes you might need to go for the bigger organisations because they have the better systems. They'll be able to provide solutions. Um, I think what I like about the industry is the moment we've never got to be so innovative. Yeah. You know, we don't have to look at a solution going, oh, we'll just put a person in a job. What That's- are some other ways that you can oh, instead now- of hiring a person do something else? We've aligned our we've we've aligned our business to different industries and different teams. So we've got assessment and development, which will just take certain parts of recruitment campaigns, finding and engage, you know, we'll take on if you don't have the time to run a three thousand apprenticeship program across the country, we'll take the bulk of that. You know, we'll handle applications. We have the systems to be able to do that. So we've got also what we call enterprise. Now, the enterprise division was created for solutions for companies big but don't have technology. So we can go in and we provide them with human capital systems, payroll systems, on-site efficiency teams to take over the process of getting people into the market. We've got Imposo now, which was rebranded recently from James Harvard, which is our IT consultancy company. All right. So working more on um, statement of works, be able to help solution-based now that IT recruitment's changing, being able to get candidates through that for a whole range of projects through periods of time. How's IT recruitment changing? I think now it's so many things. Yeah. We've had to meet the market because – a consultancy is different to what we do in labour hire. IT has access to portals and systems that the general human won't because it has different levels of authority mm-hmm. and a lot of new tech works in different fields. So for our business, we had to create an offshoot and it's the only offshoot to our bigger brand, which is enterprise, to make sure that our clients are protected and that we're protected. All right, okay. So this whole new model is essentially our own IT consultancy, but with the advantage of having the whole Hayes brand sitting behind it from mm-hmm. a human people's perspective. So if you need 180 contractors to do a Queensland health project in North Queensland, we can facilitate that. Yeah, right. Okay. That's interesting. I dare say not many organisations in Australia would be able to do that. Uh, so. Well, and please don't call that in because my yeah. North, <laughs> the North Queensland team probably just sat there and went, don't give that as an example. They're just like swallowed. And it's like, a Whoa. busy day. Yeah, they're <laughs> yeah. like, we can't. No, they can't actually. 
Awesome. Kelly, really appreciate you coming in. We've gone a little bit over time, but let's let's wrap it up there. You share some good insights around defense, how you can work with, and also some recruitment, what's happening in that in that kind of space. So looking forward to staying in touch and seeing seeing how you go with an SAA and everything else you've got going on. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And yeah, we'll see what comes next. And everyone can register for Meet the Primes too if they go to Bench On at the moment if they want to be part of the defense supply chain. Awesome. Bench on is that Bench on. Is that where yep. they go for that? Yep. And how can they reach you, Kelly, if they want to reach out? They can reach questions. out to me on LinkedIn um, or otherwise we'll put my email on this podcast later on. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks. See ya. Bye.